Um, all right, so um, maybe I can uh, get started with the introduction. So I'm super excited to have Farhan Alet here uh, to give us talk today. He's a PhD student at MIT working with Leslie Kelbling, Thomas Lozano Perez, and Josh Tannenbaum, um, working on fundamental problems in machine learning. Uh, I think um, he presents really unique uh, research background, uh, combining ideas across different threads of thoughts, including programming synthesis, meta learning, and more. Um, yeah, I'm curious to hear what you have to share with us today. Go ahead, Ferran. Awesome. Thanks, Eugene, for the introduction and for inviting me. So today I'm going to uh, present uh, my vision of uh, a more flexible uh, framework for machine learning. So let's get started. OK, cool. So in the last decade, we have seen unprecedented success in artificial intelligence, as you all know, and that's why we are here uh, in classification. We've also seen uh, successes in action, reinforcement learning, and uh, acting in the world, as well as how to make predictions, um, for instance, in the case of protein structure prediction. But there is still a lot of progress ahead. So for instance, um, the same, even if we have very reliable um, classification uh, in uh, in uh, automation uh, domains, there is still a lot of common sense understanding that's missing, especially in rare events. Like for instance, in this case, uh, a Tesla is getting confused because a truck in front of it uh, is, is, is carrying semaphores and it believes there are real semaphores and it's getting very confused about that. Uh, so how can we improve that uh, in rare events? Uh, another thing is that machine learning methods typically require millions or thousands of, of samples. So for instance, in the game of Go that I was mentioning before, it requires millions of games, but we would like uh, AI agents that learn to act or learn to understand new situations or new actions very data efficiently. And finally, um, we would like the knowledge that machine learning discovers to be composable with the knowledge that we already have. We have uh, knowledge oftentimes in the uh, form of tables or in the form of logic or in the form of scientific formulas? And how do we make uh, machine learning uh, knowledge that we discover uh, also integrate and um, being able to integrate it with, with the knowledge we already have? So let's look at uh, current uh, successes, like past successes, and look at uh, the general framework that they all fit. Most of them fit into, in, inside mapping a function, specifying uh, um, the problem as a function from input to output, like for instance, uh, images to classes, or in the case of uh, uh, Go uh, playing, we map a, a board state to the action to take and the probability of winning. Or for instance, in protein structure prediction, we would go from the sequence of amino acids to the uh, structure. So, an incredibly productive recipe has been assume there is a function and train a neural network end to end to imitate that function. Of course, it's going to be imperfect, but uh, it has a few advantages. It's a very general method and it scales to large data sets. However, as we were uh, talking before, it has also some drawbacks. It's extremely data inefficient and generalizes poorly outside of distribution, uh, among other things. So, let me call these uh, examples uh, the standard setting in the sense that they all have one neural network per task. Um, but we're going to see that this framework can be extended and can be made a lot more flexible. So in the first part of my talk, I'm going to talk about a paper of, of ours, Modular Meta Learning, where instead of having one network per task, we have many reusable neural networks per task. So what do I mean by that? I mean that we have a set of reusable neural modules, and we're going to compose them in different ways to solve a wide variety of tasks and hopefully becoming uh, more data efficient and generalizing in similar ways as language does. I'm going to talk about this a bit later. In the second part of my talk, I'm going to talk about uh, tailoring, where now instead of having one neural network per task, there is an advantage to having one neural network per input. Uh, and the reason is that the neural network uh, is going to be able to tailor to the specific characteristics of uh, each data point in, in, the, in, in our data set and be able to uh, better profit from the information of its input. And finally, I'm going to uh, talk about my vision for the future and uh, make some connections between my interests and, and those of, of the Allen Institute, and in particular, uh, the Mosaic team. So uh, let's start by modular meta learning. One second. Uh, it has become 
one, one second, it has become unstable. Okay, cool. So let's look at this, this data set. Um, in particular, if we only look at this image on below, we, have, we can see that it's pretty hard to parse, right? It would be pretty hard to understand which function it was. However, if I gave you as context, the fact that there's other functions in my data set that uh, look like this, that look like sinusoids, then maybe it's pretty easy to um, make sense of the image and understand that actually this is also going to be a sinusoid and then I can predict that. So this is the idea of meta learning. And uh, this has uh, been very popular for many years because um, it allows us to be very data efficient. So in this case, we would be able to extrapolate, uh, sorry, kind of generalize thanks to having other tasks that are related. So um, this literature goes uh, a long time ago, even to the 90s, uh, and it has been a, a, a resurgence in the last decade leveraging neural networks. In particular, um, many of the methods uh, um, kind of work around the idea of uh, parameter uh, tuning, uh, which has also been very useful in fine tuning from supervised data. So, for instance, in the paper of uh, model diagnostic meta learning, MAML by Finedal proposes to have one base neural network and then fine tune the neural network to each task in order, in order to generalize from few data points. And hopefully, in this way, we can be data efficient. So, the nice thing about this is it improves data efficiency, and it's very easy to code in our modern frameworks of, uh, of uh, TensorFlow and, and PyTorch and so on. Um, However, it has some disadvantages. First, uh, there is new parameters for each set of tasks. Moreover, if we want to fine tune all the parameters, we're going to have to co have a set of a, a copy for each uh, task, and then we're going to reuse the entire network. Uh, so we're not going to have much computational efficiency. And finally, in general, these methods tend to uh, fine tune the network with one or two gradient descent steps. So by definition, we have to be pretty close in terms of the function we want to specify. We cannot make large jumps. However, that's not how uh, us humans generalize and, and, and tackle tasks that we have never seen before, right? Uh, what we do is we have some knowledge uh, in a form of enough concepts or kind of uh, habits that we have. And we can compose the things that we know and the skills we know in novel ways. So for instance, language is a great example of that. Every word, we all know the, the meaning and the concept behind each word, but every sentence is new because I'm composing known concepts in novel ways. And so I was interested uh, into how can we bring this insight into meta learning in order to make uh, machine learning more data efficient. So let's look at a more challenging set of functions here, you can see that the functions look uh, kind of not random, structurally meaningful, but also very, uh, very different from one another. So now if I tell you, oh, can you predict this function over here? It's going to be pretty hard. However, if you notice that the first four functions come from combining a basis set of functions and now uh, adding two of them together, different pairs for different for different functions, suddenly, once you have access to this basic set of functions, now generalizing to the new one, just is a, it's just about how can I combine what I know in a new way to generalize to my new data set. Notice that here there's two problems. Um, here, of course, these functions that I'm showing here are well known, like the absolute value or the step function or uh, a sign. But in general, we would like to be able to deal with high dimensional inputs, high dimensional outputs. And so we would like to be able to not just hard code them, but actually learn them and let them be neural networks that can handle these high dimensional inputs and outputs. And finally, we can then uh, adapt to the new task by searching the new composition. And so searching the, the other composition is uh, also a, a problem in itself. So, Let's, the, let's call the first uh, type of meta-learning that I've, uh, I've explained, parametric meta-learning, because it's parameter-based. We start with an untrained network, and we see a set of tasks, right? In machine learning, we usually have a single task with a training and a test set. Now we have a set of training tasks. And now we are going to have, uh, eventually, after uh, seeing the meta-training, we have an adaptable network. And then at meta-test time, we see a small training set, and we adapt the network so that uh, we generalize to the test set. In contrast, modular meta-learning starts with untrained modules. 
So we are going to have not one neural network, but multiple neural networks. And after seeing uh, many tasks, we eventually train them to have a set of composable modules. What does it mean for them to be composable? Uh, well, that means that when we see a new task with few moments of data, we can search for the best structure, and that best structure is going to generate to the test set. These ideas are not uh, opposite to each other. They can actually be combined. So actually, what we can have is we can start again with untrained modules. And after seeing a set of data, we have both composable and adaptable modules so that they can generalize by uh, finding the best composition of their adaptations. Cool. So in one thing that we need to specify before starting is how to compose the given modules. So we could uh, sum them up, compose them as in like the output of one function is the input to another function. We could concatenate them. They could become nodes and edges in graph neural networks or uh, specific uh, attention modules in uh, transformers, for instance. And in this way, once we specify not the exact composition, but kind of the language of compositions, now we can start our, our problem. This is similar to how we would specify the architecture of a neural network without necessarily specifying the weights of the neural network. This problem is pretty hard. So it actually has two problems. In particular, we have to find the best structure for each data set. And this is a discrete problem, right? Because every uh, once you switch the structure, you're going to have make a jump. And even if your structure may be very good, but the local change may be actually suddenly very bad. Um, and we also have to find good module weights. So uh, neural network weights such that the modules work well, not just for one task, but across all tasks. And this one lives in the differentiable optimization realm. So our approach uh, in hindsight is pretty simple. We, what we do is uh, um, kind of realize that this is a chicken and egg problem, right? Because um, the modules, if we have random modules and the modules don't do anything meaningful, finding the best structure, finding the best composition of meaning, meaningless modules, it's also meaningless. Moreover, if the compositions are random, really optimizing the modules for the random structures to do well is also going to be uh, quite unfruitful. So uh, let's look at how we do that. Well, the first thing we can notice is that if we take the simplest approach, we could uh, use simulated annealing, which is one of the most uh, classic algorithms for discrete optimization um, for optimizing the structure for its data set. And we can use green descent uh, to optimize the module weights. So essentially, we're going to have a set of tasks. And for each task, we're going to have a, a, a corresponding structure built of composable modules. So these modules, it's kind of a set of, of neural networks. And we're going to have, a, at any point in time, we're going to have a candidate uh, structure for that data set. And you can see that the modules are reused uh, across structures. So now, first thing we can notice is that Every structure is a composition of neural networks and it's end to end differentiable. That means that we can train them via gradient descent and eventually train all the, all the new neural network weights across uh, all the tasks and pull the updates from different tasks into the same uh, neural network. Given a, a few modules, we can also optimize the structure via simulated annealing and propose changes um, to the structure by either deleting or changing a module or adding a new module to the structure. Um, notice that we want not just always always accept only even only if uh, the structure does better. Sometimes we want to try uh, worse structures for the sake of exploration and not running into local optimum. Finally, the solution is to essentially alternate in an EM fashion both methods. So essentially, we have simulated annealing with a given temperature, and we're going to alternate between optimizing the structures given the weights and optimizing the weights given the structure. And as we go along, we're going to eventually reach, find the best structure for each data set in our training set and find good module weights that work across the entire meta training set. So let's look at how, how this looks like for uh, the function, the sum of functions data set. So here are some functions in our tr meta training set. You can see that they look like sums of popular functions, but none of them are popular functions in themselves. And the modules start completely untrained. Um, 
But as we go along, at first they all look like each other, but eventually they start to specialize. And the reason they have to specialize is because eventually uh, they want to be able to span the entire set of functions with a finite amount of neural modules. And so they have to eventually find the good set of functions that, uh, so that with composing uh, some of them, you eventually represent the entire set of functions on your method training set. If you want to um, be able to optimize, also adapt the module weights uh, inside, in, inside the optimization, we can integrate MAML, which is, uh, uh, again, the, the basic, uh, the vanilla parametric meta learning method, uh, very simply by just changing the loss and adding the gradients and optimization inside. So let's look at performance. First, we start with the science data set that I, I was telling you about. And you can see that actually, Parametric meta learning does better than modular meta learning. And why is that? Well, it has a pretty easy explanation. The set of functions here, really, they all come from the same function class, except that they vary two parameters, A and B. So you change the frequency and you change the, the kind of the deviation in the angle. Um, and these two parameters can be continuously changed. So there are infinite amount of configurations possible. But by definition, we the purely modular approach has only a finite, exponentially large, but finite amount of compositions. And so it's going to not be able to represent all possible sinusoids. However, you can see that what does best is actually having both a modular and a parametric approach. And the reason is that there's actually um, some structure to this data set. It's, it's a sine function composed with a linear transformation. So if we can actually learn a module that perfectly learns the sine function, well, we really don't need to adapt its weights and suddenly we will be able to generate a lot better. The second data set we tried uh, among the toy ones, it's uh, the sum of functions data set I was telling you about. And here you can see that the best approach is a purely modular approach. And that makes sense because it fits its function class, right? Uh, the data set is a composition of true functions without any parameter changes. It just sums uh, of popular functions. And so the modular approach is able to actually find uh, all the popular functions, be able to rep represent them very accurate, accurately. And uh, it does better than combining it with the parametric approach, the reason being that it knows that it doesn't have to adapt. Whereas the parametric approach combined with the modular approach, it doesn't know that it, uh, it shouldn't adapt. However, if you give more points, so instead of uh, one to four points as this example, which is pretty small, if you give them 16 points, they all do very well. The parametric approach eventually realizes it uh, doesn't have to adapt. We also try it in real scenarios like robotics here, where we are pushing uh, um, an object and trying to predict where it's going to go. Uh, in particular, sometimes this is quite unstable because if you push, for instance, here in the center, sometimes it randomly goes to the left, sometimes it goes to the right. And it depends on the geometry of the object as well as the surface. But it, in practice, the surface doesn't really matter that much. What really matters is the object. And we tried it with these uh, 10 objects over here, or 11. Um, we have uh, our composition now instead of a sum of modules. It's a tension mechanism, uh, and it's inspired by the theoretical model of pushing. And the intuition here is that we have a set of modules that tells us where to attend, and a set of modules that makes the predictions. And the interesting thing here is that we can look at the module composition for each uh, task in our data set. Notice that there is 44 uh, data sets, tasks, uh, composed of 11 objects times four surfaces. And we can see that the module composition depends on the object, but not on the surface, agreeing with the theoretical models. Not only that, but actually discovers structure in the domain. You can see that the modules uh, were shared more commonly between ellipses, between these three ellipses over here, and between the triangles. And that the butterfly and the triangle number three, which was very big, uh, these two objects over here, were especially uh, uh, modules were kind of designed just for those objects in mind. So that's encouraging in the way that essentially we are able to um, use modules where it matters the most and where they're more uh, relevant. Let's look at, at a second real data set. Uh, here it's we are predicting making um, kind of motion prediction uh, for humans. We have ten actions and eleven actors. Like here, for instance, you can see a human throwing a ball, but there is other actions like jumping or punching or sitting down. Overall, there's a, like a hundred tasks. 
And here the composition is going to be very simple. We make each module predict one of the limbs. And the intuition over here is that we thought, oh, maybe if we predict the motion of its limb independently, we can generalize by realizing that different actions are uh, motions of uh, limbs we have seen before, but uh, compose them in a different way. And again, we can see that um, the structures of the modules, how they were composed, uh, actually matched our intuition in the way that uh, it depended on the action, but not on the subjects performing the action. And it found structure, like for instance, waving one hand and waving two hands over here, you can see that they share a lot of modules because they're very similar tasks. Or for instance, jumping in place and jumping jacks. Again, they're going to be very similar between each other, but maybe they're very different from um, bending or punching. So overall, that's encouraging, but, but not only that, it also improves performance. We can see that over our, the four data sets, uh, we are able to obtain better performance as well. So let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of this method. First, the disadvantages is that we have still no general composition method. So uh, at the beginning, I was telling you, oh, you have to specify the language of compositions, whether you want to compose them, like the output of one is the input of the other, you want to sum them up, or you want to feed them into a graphing network or a transformer. But that could be turned into an advantage because it also gives us flexibility of design. The second thing is that it has discrete optimization. Um, so we are optimizing the structure within each data set. And that's usually slow to train because we don't have gradients. And so that's going to be uh, pretty time consuming. That we partially address that by having an approach that resembles alpha zero, where there's a kind of a model, uh, neural network that predicts the, the kind of informs the search of the simulated annealing. I can talk uh, about this more in question time if you're interested. Um, but there is many pros to this approach. First one is that as we go along to more tasks, um, I think this uh, modularity is a very promising approach to avoid catastrophic forgetting because we have seen how modules are used where they're, they're more relevant. And so they're going to keep being trained on tasks for which they're meaningful and so it's unlikely that they will be, uh, or less likely that they will forget uh, tasks that they had learned before, because we will not be update them for all the tasks. Moreover, we only use a subset of the modules that we have available. Like for instance, maybe we have 10 modules, but we only choose three of them to compose them and, and do a new tasks. And we're able to explode the structure when we know it, like the structures I was telling you about for each data set, we exploited the fact that we knew, oh, it's a sum of two functions, it's a composition of two functions, or maybe the limbs of the human are relatively independent. And finally, the one I'm more excited, most excited about is this language like infinite using of finite means. What this means is that we have a finite amount of modules, uh, maybe 10, 20, 100 as we scale up, uh, but there is an exponential amount of ways in which we can compose these modules. Uh, and so that allows us to uh, be able to represent a, a large amount of tasks, a large amount of scenes as we go forward. And I'm going to talk about this more uh, in the conclusion when we look at uh, the future ahead. Are there any questions so far? Okay. Oh, I, I, I heard some noise, but- Raj, um, do you want to go ahead and speak? Yeah, uh, so I just wanted to get a little clarification. So um, are the individual modules, um, like for the subtasks, like the actual split up of the subtasks, something that requires uh, human expert feedback per data set? Um, or uh, is mm -hmm. that also discovered? I, I was just a little unclear on that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so there is one thing that requires human specification, which is kind of the language of composition. So here, um, this, we need to say, oh, take two modules and add them up. That's how we're going to compose them. Or for instance, in the pushing data set over, now I cannot find it. Um, in the pushing data set uh, here, we were saying, oh, the way you compose these modules is you have two types of modules. One of them is going to tell you where to attend and the other one is going to make the prediction. And you're essentially going to do an attention mechanism over the predictions of the G modules. But um, no, um, what the algorithm gives you is the weight, the weights, the neural network weights of Fs and Gs. So it trains all the neural networks and it also tells you the ISOP case, so which modules you use on each data set. And that's why it's nice that it recovers some structure because it didn't know the data sets uh, coming from Ellipse 1 were necessarily close to those data sets in Ellipse 2. It automatically discovered that. 
because it okay. was useful for making predictions. Does this answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. So you you define a vocabulary, but it then discovers the structure of how it's composed. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And just to clarify, the composition functions are not parameterized. They are just. Uh, yeah, I, the, usually there. You mean that there's no extra parameters beyond the weights inside the modules, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but uh, usually um, neural networks. You can either add them. You could. You could uh, have a few parameters that also are also um, adapted, and the algorithm I think would not change much in in terms of the when the, the algorithm would not change with respect to the. So I presented two algorithms. One that is purely modular, and one that has both parametric and modular components. And so it would be similar to the one that has modular and, and parametric components. And the second thing is that neural networks are very expressive. So um, if you adapt the parameters at uh, at test time as well, so in, at, when adapting, uh, usually that compensates for not having parameters in, inside the composition itself. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, one more, Ani. Uh, yeah. quick, quick question. So um, I understood how the compositionality has been sort of uh, learned for this data set. But you said something very interesting about the motion capture data set. Mm -hmm. so you said that uh, each basis network or whatever you call it, each, mod each, mod each module mm -hmm. has learned to represent one limb. Is that something yeah. that's hand coded or is that something that emerged out of learning compositionality? That's a good question. Yes, uh, I think we this one we hard coded, and the reason we hard coded it is because actually, um, it, you the number of points in each limb I think was slightly different, so the input output space was was different, and so we had to say, oh, the modules that have I don't know ten outputs represent a leg, and the, one, the modules that represent a, 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 an arm have eight or something like this. But I could imagine. Uh, I don't think. If, for instance, we, they, the input-output space fitted, I, I'm pretty sure we would be able to uh, also automatically discover each limb because it's a similar problem. I'm, I may be wrong about this, but I'm, given what I've seen experimentally, uh, it's pretty good at discovering these inherent structures. So in the same way that it was able to discover that uh, the, the it, use, it should use the same modules for waving one hand and two hands, or maybe also pretty common like waving one hand and clapping hands, for instance, right? Um, it, it's able to find these complex relations. Uh, I'm pretty sure it would also be able to discover um, specializations and say, oh, I'm going to take care of the torso or I'm going to take off care of the arm. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the questions. Cool. So I'm going to move to the second part of the talk, uh, which is a paper we call tailoring. And it's more of a principle than a paper. It is a paper as well, but uh, it has come kind of a, a message on itself, which is that adaptation is useful even when you are uh, in the same distribution as, as where you train. So we have seen in machine learning a lot of uh, cases, use cases for adaptation. Like for instance, people train on ImageNet or large language models and then fine tune them to do well on a smaller related data set, right? With supervised information. We have also seen how uh, we could use unsupervised data, like for instance, when things change like a new task or out of the distribution or maybe going from uh, virtual images to uh, real images, you could use un unlabeled data. Maybe the, the adaptation is going to be slightly worse, but at least you don't need labels to adapt. But it still uh, leaves you asking, oh, why would we need to adapt when we're inside the, the same distribution? Um, so there is a very neat idea from the 90s, uh, which is much less popular nowadays, uh, which is transactive learning. And the intuition here is that you should leverage the fact that you know the input uh, at prediction time. And that's not intuitive in low dimension, but in higher dimensions actually could become very useful because all the points are pretty far away from each other. And uh, the input is by far the most, the closest point uh, relevant to itself, right? So not only is it going to be the, mo the closest input to itself by definition, but there is a miles away of any other point because in high dimensions, everything tends to be pretty uh, evenly distributed and usually pretty far away. Um, so, and I, th I think this is going to become increasingly relevant 
as we train in broader and broader uh, training distributions like GPT-3 or, or DALI. So let's look, give an example uh, where we may want to adapt at prediction time and leverage some of the insights of transactive learning. Imagine you have a planetary system. Uh, here I'm going. I'm using only one planet and, and the sun, but in, in our experiments we have like, I think, five planets. There is an input and there is a target future uh, of this planet. Um, we don't know the target, but what we can assume is that energy is conserved, right, in physics. And so we know that and the target has the same energy as the input. When we make a prediction, in general, uh, in machine learning, uh, for unseen inputs, we're going to make some mistake. Um, sometimes big, sometimes small, but some mistake. And in particular, we can compute, if we know the formula for the energy, we can compute the uh, energy for the prediction and for the input. And we can say, are you conserving energy or not? And then you can specify these laws, which we call Taylor laws, because it's going to be tailored for that specific input. For another input, it's going to be a different uh, number, a different formula, same formula, sorry, but a different optimization. And then we say, oh, you should conserve energy because if your, if your prediction conserves energy, it's much more likely that it's actually correct. We can back propagate this tailoring loss, update the parameters of the neural network just for that one input, and that's going to change our prediction. But we have not yet committed to it, right? Because we are still not having seen the, the target. So we can in first ensure energy conservation. Hopefully, conserving the energy is going to improve our prediction and make it much closer to the target, even though we didn't need to see the target at all. So if we look at classic machine learning, uh, so inductive learning, we receive a data set and at training time, which here I, I put on red, we have a supervised loss. So in the case of the planets, we would say, how close are your predictions? And you could also even add uh, energy conservation to the supervised loss if you wanted to. Uh, so one unsupervised loss here. but. At test time, the model, the, the parameters are frozen, and you eventually just give an input to the model and you get a prediction. Transactive learning, um, the idea is that you don't train at all and you wait until you receive the entire test set and you say, okay, now I have my test set. I only really care about those predictions. So now I should take them into account when I when I when I train. And you do the, you do the entire training function inside the prediction. And so you optimize a supervised loss for uh, your training data set and an unsupervised loss for your test set and eventually out comes a prediction. It has two big disadvantages. One of them I'm not going to talk about today, for, but I can, I can speak more on the question time if you're interested. But one of the bigger ones is that it actually, this takes uh, maybe 10 hours to train a neural network. We don't want to wait 10 hours to, uh, to make a prediction. But uh, neural networks are usually be able to fine tune. So, uh, the idea behind tailoring is that we can still do the same training as inductive learning. And now this unsupervised loss, which we call tailor loss, but essentially just an unsupervised loss, you notice that there is no Y over here. We can make a small adaptation to the weights and find uh, weights that depend just on that input X. They're tailored to the input X. And then we use the those weights to make the final prediction. Let's look at some results. Uh, for the planet experiment I was telling you about. Inductive learning does not do any tailoring. So here on the x-axis we have tailoring and here we have energy conservation and here prediction. So we're going to, it's going to sit on the y-axis, right? Tailoring, it optimizes uh, the energy. So it's going to for sure make it energy conservation. So it's going to make it go down a lot. Of course, the prediction is not going to improve as much because we don't get to see that and we don't get to optimize it directly. But from out of nothing, with the same training procedure, we're able to do 7.5% better, which is already a big gain, given that the training procedure is exactly the same. And the main intuition here is that the, the physics laws, the tailoring laws, and the prediction laws are connected. So there's a correlation, so they're go both going to go down. There's two things that we could have done differently. The first thing is that instead of fine-tuning the weights, we could have made the prediction and then forget that the prediction came from a, a neural network and optimize the prediction directly. That helps a bit, but it kind of finds adversarial examples in output space. It forgets that it still has to stay consistent with the dynamics of physics, with whatever we learned at training time. And so it's only improved by less than 1%. It improves, but very little. 
Another thing that we could have done is say, hey, why don't you use the entire testset as transactive learning does? Why don't you uh, adapt with the entire testset? It's 6,400 samples. Uh, I've heard that in machine learning, using more data is always better. Well, it's not. And the main intuition is that um, we have we already had quality supervised information. And now we are optimizing with an unsupervised loss with this energy conservation. But energy conservation and and uh, making good predictions, they're aligned, but not perfectly aligned. For instance, if you predict the input, you conserve energy, but you don't make you don't predict the future if you predict that you're going to stay in the same place. And so because you have to make energy conserved for not one point now, but 6,400 points, you're going to have to deviate a lot in weight space. You're going to have to move very far away in model space. And therefore, you're going to ha eventually have this catastrophic forgetting and forgetting about making good predictions, and that results in worse um, in, in, in worse predictions. Finally, there's the idea of meta tailoring, which I'm going to talk about now, which actually changes the, the way you train by taking tailoring into account. And that does much better, sorry, very quickly. Not only does it start better because it encodes the inductive bias at training time, but it also is monotonic. You can see the here, it actually goes down continually. Whereas both the purple uh, line and the green line go down, but eventually go slightly up because they both forget about the real objective, which it was making good predictions. So what's meta tailoring? The idea is that if you know that at test time, you're going to do this adaptation, well, then it's not correct to train without the adaptation. You should really take into account this blue box, this adaptation, this fine tuning, you should take it into account inside your prediction function also at training time. So what you are really doing now is say, hey, I want to do good predictions after uh, optimizing with energy conservation or with my unsupervised loss in general. So let's look at the simplest possible algorithm, uh, Mammoth, which is a translation of Mammoth in meta learning. But notice that we're still in the sim single task setting. So actually we take, uh, it's a very uh, small change with respect to gradient descent. This is vanilla gradient descent, random initialize the weights, take a batch of samples, take a gradient step. The only change is that we compute tailored weights where we take a one or more gradient descent steps with an unsupervised loss. You don't have the target Y. Then you get these tailored weights. And now when you do the outer optimization with a supervised loss, you don't use the vanilla weights, you use the tailored weights. So in meta learning, we usually have one loss, right? Before I was talking about generalizing uh, in terms of uh, making predicting functions from few examples. And the function was always the same, regression, but different points. We were generalizing from a small training set to a test set. In meta tailoring, we only have one point, x sub i. But we have two losses, the tailoring loss, which is unsupervised, and the supervised loss. And we want to do well on the supervised loss after optimizing on the unsupervised loss. Um, one good thing about this method is that we can actually do well also and encode inductive biases softly, meaning that, for instance, if in this case in real life and uh, systems don't fully conserve energy, but because we are not fully imposing it unless we do many gradient descent steps, uh, we can also encode soft conservation loss. Whereas architecture based inductive biases uh, usually are have hard constraints. So, for instance, here we compare against Hamiltonian neural network networks, which fully conserve energy. You can see the blue line here is pretty much constant. And a vanilla neural network um, without the inductive bias of energy conservation quickly loses energy. We take the same architecture and add meta tailoring to it, and we can softly encode energy, resulting in much better predictions. Cool. So in terms of uh, pros of tailoring, one nice thing that I'm not going to talk about now is that it actually is a very general framework. I've only explained um, the applications in physics, but actually uh, in, the, the, in the paper, we also have examples in adversarial examples, and we have applications as well in contrastive learning, using contrastive learning for better and data efficient uh, classification. It's very easy to implement because you just have to ask for what you want. You want soft, uh, smoothness, you ask for smoothness in the loss. You want energy conservation, you specify it via code, and it's going to take be taken care of by TensorFlow or PyTorch or JAX. And then you have the same training and test behavior. Um, some inductive biases, sometimes like auxiliary losses, if you train for energy conservation at training time, that does not guarantee you have energy conservation at test time. If you do it inside the prediction function, you do. And uh, it does not interfere with the task loss, meaning that we trained uh, the energy conservation optimization to help the prediction. 
And as we saw with the experiment, we can softly encode uh, properties. Has two cons. The first one is that it's extra computation time because you have to do the first forward propagation, do the back propagation, and do the forward propagation again. So doing it naively usually results in 200% uh, uh, increase in, in, uh, in time. But if you fine tune the top layers, usually that can be made uh, much shorter. And the second thing is that it requires you knowing the inductive bias and specifying it via code. So for instance, in the pendulum experiment, we were using the position and velocity. So very briefly, let me explain a follow-up paper we had where we actually discovered some of these inductive biases. We have seen that symmetries are a very general way of encoding uh, inductive biases in machine learning, like for instance, translation invariance, permutation invariance, or root translation equivariance. Um, but some of these symmetries are either unknown or difficult to encode. Like for instance, imagine encoding TAM invariance from pixels. What, how would we even start encoding TAM invariance from pixels? It's, it's, it's pretty hard. We can do it maybe uh, from state information, but that's even uh, sometimes hard. So the question is, can we use meta learning to discover them? And that's uh, another networks paper with Dylan Doblar, Alan Cho, Kenji Kawaguchi, and Charles Sifi. The main insight that we had is that symmetries are hard to discover because they talk about counterfactuals. So for instance, time, time symmetry, time invariance uh, says, if I were to run the same experiment tomorrow, the physics or the world will be the same. However, another networks, uh, no, sorry, not another networks, another theorem tells us that for every such symmetry, there is a corresponding conservation law. So for instance, for time invariance, we have energy conservation. So maybe we can use these conservations uh, on which can be directly evaluated on raw data, right? We can check whether a quantity is conserved or not. And uh, we, I'm a bit tight on time, so I'm not going to explain it in detail, but the main intuition is that whereas before we had a formula for energy conservation, now we have a neural network for energy conservation, which is part of the training um, computation graph. And so we can actually train and discover this conservation law now, and that allows us to uh, do better in video prediction. So now actually we are able to discover inductive biases and apply them not in state information, but in video. And if we look at what the neural network is looking at, uh, the most important dimension that captures 84% of the variance is this one over here. And you can see that it mostly looks at the object falling now. So what are the key takeaways for this second section? The first one is that adaptation is useful even when nothing changes. And so that's uh, very relevant in order to encode properties about them. The second one is that conserved quantities act as a proxy for symmetries. And finally, that this prediction time optimization is a very general way of uh, enforcing some properties. Looking forward, uh, I'm very excited about uh, tackling, uh, using some of these methods for tackling different problems. In particular, we have uh, two big methods in AI. We have learning and we have search, and they have uh, its own uh, advantages and disadvantages. Learning is global, tends to be pretty fast at prediction time, and it's approximate. Um, and search tends to be local, uh, exact, meaning that you usually have some model, but uh, tends to be slow. And search, oops, sorry, there's a small typo, and learning uh, have been com uh, combined offline, like for instance in Alpha AlphaZero, uh, where learning can inform the search. But tailoring actually suggests that you can also combine them online. And the main intuition here is that uh, search gives us some very, very relevant information um, about uh, the problem you, you, you're, you have at hand. And you could leverage that in order to uh, kind of tailor the model and make it more relevant for the exact problem you, you care about. So for instance, um, there is uh, in, in language modeling, uh, in some of your papers that I've seen, there is uh, some complicated search problem that you have to tackle where some generation uh, is constrained on uh, a variety of, of constraints that you want to impose. And in general, finding such a generation that satisfies all the constraint and is consistent with the, the, the beginning of the sentence tends to be pretty tricky. And it's a, a complicated search problem in itself. However, maybe some preliminary text generations can be informative about what's working and what's not working and can better inform how we search. Um, Method-wise, it's also quite related to the experts in the sense that um, we're both uh, exploiting the fact that uh, it's, um, there is a, a huge advantage into uh, trying to learn and adapt at decoding time. 
not just expanding a lot of resources by training the methods, uh, the, the large language models offline, but can we do that also online with a small computational effort? We can have a lot of leverage as well. Um, the second thing I'm excited about is um, learn, learn term consistency in neural language models. So we have seen how uh, large language models often have long-term consistency issues. Uh, usually it looks very good locally, but uh, globally, uh, when you start getting beyond a few paragraphs, uh, you quickly uh, get uh, contradictions and things that are not consistent. We applied it to video in the sense that we say, oh, in video, of course, the frame is not going to stay constant, but there is some properties that are going to be approximately constant, like momentum conservation or object consistency. Uh, in text, it's much harder because it, it's discrete uh, and it's pretty challenging. And it's also not as obvious like that a single word, a single word is not closer to a state as an image is, right? An image is not state, but uh, two, in two images are almost state very often, even though sometimes you have occlusions and things like this. Text is much harder, but also very, very impactful if we could uh, ha uh, help Im improve consistency. And finally, uh, one direction I'm, I'm very interested in is combining program synthesis with deep learning models and ideas from modular meta learning. So this is unpublished work led by Shreyas Kapura, uh, uh, one of my mentees I mentor with Josh Tenenbaum. And we are interested in learning a new environment to understand it very, very quickly from pixels, but super efficiently. So you, you probably know that reinforcement learning methods uh, tend to have millions of samples and generalize with hours or sometimes, well, at least one day of experience. We're trying to see, can you understand an environment within a couple of minutes? And what we do is we kind of learn to segment uh, the, uh, the scene uh, with objects, and then we learn a program behind the scene. What program is generating the environment? And of course, at the beginning, we don't know anything, and we eventually fall to the ground. But now the, the search, our search knows that uh, falling to the ground kills us. So second attempt already, compare that to neural network, which would take thousands of attempts, would know, oh, the ground kills us. So eventually we keep playing. We don't fall to the ground anymore, but we fall with a column and we realize, oh, columns kill us now. So now the model has realized the dynamics of the game. It knows the gravity it, approximately. It knows how to segment the images and it knows that uh, you shouldn't collide with the ground or the columns. And so it's now at the third attempt already, super data efficiently, it's able to uh, start to play the game. There's still some vision inaccuracies and it eventually falls down, but it's not because of misunderstanding the, the environment. And this is a, a something that I'm very excited to not just have for one game, but can we have a, a wide variety of scenes and interpret the programs behind them? And one thing I'm pretty excited about is kind of taking these program-like representations and feed them into uh, neural module networks type ideas that uh, are able to have one neural network, as we were doing for modular meta learning, for each scene. Uh, and this is related to some work uh, done here, both in terms of um, method, like for instance, having a, a symbolic dynamics model uh, coupled with a language model in order to be able to leverage uh, programs representations for predicting the future, but as well as uh, in terms of goals. So for instance, can we uh, learn to represent scenes in terms of the objects and their interactions? And can we learn to parse the programs that are kind of generating those scenes, even if they're just approximate representations, to be able to answer questions about them uh, and be able to manipulate our representations of them. So can we uh, kind of first parse uh, these program-like representations generating our data and then use them to say, oh, how can we act in the world? How can we interpret what currently is, like in the case of, of, of the data set below, or uh, also conjecturing what it could be because we could make edits to the program and we could say, oh, now, what? how does the scene look like? What, what would it be in this case, right? In, if you were able to do that. Of course, this is also more akin to being able to, um, to ingest not just uh, still images, but actually videos and be able to uh, uh, parse those videos and understand them, not just as a bunch of pixels and, and uh, feed them to a convolutional neural network. Uh, I think a, a good start is already being able to combine them with with language representations that is are going to inform from a qualitative sense what what um what is going on 
But we, I think we should go one step further and say, oh, the object, the, the, the video we're representing, it's really uh, a series of objects following uh, some pattern. And that's also connected as Merlot was kind of, uh, it's based on uh, to what is being said and, and what is uh, being represented. And so that could give us a uh, very nice representation. Of course, we're still uh, a couple of steps ahead. Uh, uh, kind of, we still have a couple of steps ahead in the sense of uh, scenes in YouTube videos are much more challenging than Atari games, but uh, I'm very excited uh, about these directions. And finally, I want to thank uh, my collaborators and especially my mentees from which I've learned a lot during my PhD. Thanks for your attention. That was a great talk, thank you. And um, any questions from the audience? I, I think um, some of us have a one-on-one -on -one scheduled and we have about six minutes left. So especially those without meeting, go first. Uh, while people uh, think about the questions, actually, I want to ask, um, I, yeah, um, maybe mine will take a little bit longer time to brew, but um, maybe one like one way to ask some aspect of my question might be, mm -hmm. um, do, do you think this compositionality can be potentially applicable to language task where the compositional functions are perhaps less clear? In what in what sense? So you mean like uh, lang la la by language test you mean where you you only have uh, words, right? Um, like let's uh, QA problems. I'm, actually, I'm referring to your first part of the talk, uh -huh. um, and uh, it seems maybe it's more uh, like somehow robotics um, applications seem more uh, applicable than language tasks though i really really like what you said there about infinite use of a finite modules and in theory yeah. the approach was actually inspired by language uh, or yeah. uh, in, the, in the sense so uh i'm not an expert in nlp um so i may be wrong about this but intuitively it makes a lot of sense to me that um Language by construction is is compositional, right? We use uh, words, we are assembling them into sub sentences, and eventually uh, everything is is composed of of smaller parts fitting into larger parts. Of course, the current uh, current large language models don't look like this syntax based or compositional approaches, but uh, classic uh, NLP used to have these parsings and exploit the compositionality behind them. Uh, so uh, I believe that. Um, going back to some of these methods, but while still being able to capture and, and handle the, the flexibility of modern language models uh, could uh, be able to uh, allow us to leverage uh, the hidden compositionality beyond pairs of, uh, of words um, and kind of being able to represent higher level points. Yeah, I could keep going on and on about this point, but anyone else who wanted to ask a question? or else um, so uh, language as an object is compositional there's no doubt about it does that mean that understanding of language should also be compositional or not and um, it feels right to assume that it's compositional empirically uh, though the monolithic larger models without modular substrates have been winning and it's curious why that's the case. Yeah. And are we doing something really incredibly wrong with architecture of modular networks to not win over the stupid monolithic networks? <laughs> I think there is also like this very interesting paper, I think one or two years ago about the hardware lottery uh, in the sense that it's not only about how you fit with the problem setting, it's also how you fit with the current hardware at hand. And so if the current hardware at hand um, matches very well, um, very parallel uh, like evaluations and very uh, uniform like evaluations, then uh, it doesn't necessarily tell you that it's better suited for the problem. It tells you that it's better suited 
for the hardware, right? And that's one of the main motivations behind, mm. as, you, as you know, um, behind transformers. And so um, I think there's still value for multiple reasons. One, uh, you may find more computationally efficient ways uh, to tackle that. Two, uh, if the hardware changes, uh, which eventually it will change, um, it's possible that some of the methods that were not suited for uh, current hardware, maybe five years on, down the road, are better suited for them. Uh, and so that suddenly, or maybe not even not even just the hardware, maybe the the, the software. So, for instance, one one quick quick example is I was talking about tailoring how um, the weights change for every input, and that's super hard to to make that efficient. And we had to I didn't talk about it, but we had to implement a new algorithm that made that efficient. But actually, while we were doing that, uh, uh, the new uh, um, JAX framework was invented, right? We have we usually only had PyTorch and TensorFlow dominating. Now JAX has come along. And in JAX, it's super easy to implement per element weights. Mm -hmm. um, and suddenly, implementing that became very easy. Uh, so uh, I think it's worth thinking about problem uh, fit, um, even if there is not a hardware fit at the moment. Or a software fit because that can change it at any time. And thinking about the fundamentals of the problem, uh, we know that the problem won't change. Whereas the hardware and the software may change, the problem won't change. Uh, and so thinking about that, I think it's it's fruitful. I like this a lot. I mean, um, actually, I've been recently asked by some hardware folks, can I just tell them, you know, rosy, wishful thoughts about what changes that they could make so that. We can suddenly do neuro symbolic integration. Mm -hmm. you know, I realized that I've been so brainwashed to think within this current framework. So I wasn't sure what to suggest right away. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, one, one example is that uh, um, so one of my mentors, uh, Josh Tunema, one advisors, um, does a lot of program synthesis and MCMC and, and this type of stuff. And apparently, I, I don't know the, the all the details, but apparently having a lot of CPUs, like uh, imagine a, a computer with like 1,000, 2,000 CPUs, it's very useful for some of the problems that, that he's handling. And so he he's talking with some companies on how can you get this type of, of, of hardware um, to be able to scale some of the program synthesis methods to, uh, uh, to, to scale efficiently. Yeah. So we're at time. Um, any question? One last chance. All right. So we'll um, uh, continue through our one-on-one -on -one then. Awesome. Uh, let's thank Baron again. Thanks, Baron. Thank you. Very inspiring talk. Looking forward to uh, the one-on-one. -on -one. See you. Bye, Jason. Bye. Bye-bye.